Good evening. We continue with our Jammu and Kashmir coverage. 17 days since the crackdown. Today, postpaid mobile services were finally restored in the valley. Finally, relatives will be able to reach their loved ones who are living in Kashmir, who had been living effectively in a communication black hole for over two months. That since the centre abrogated the state's special status on August 5th. Now, here is what the situation looks like on day 70 of the clampdown. Mobile postpaid services have been restored, but if you are somebody who uses prepaid in the valley, you still can't access any kind of telecom service. Internet is still blocked in the valley, so that shut down. For internet still continues 70 days on. Landline services are functional. There is very thin attendance in schools even now, even, even though schools have been now functional for over several weeks. Emergency services are obviously functional. Even though the state has been opened up for tourism just now, obviously right now nobody has reached the valley as a tourist. Shops do open but remain largely closed through the day. Public transport is not working. Our political leaders are still in detention. But we actually were finally able to make a simple call to our correspondent, uh, Srinagar Bureau Chief, Meer Farid. And that itself was a bit of a relief for us. And in fact, Farid is joining us right now live. Farid, uh, so good to be able to speak with you. What's the latest you've got for us from Srinagar? Tanvi, you pretty much summed it up. Uh, it's, it's a mix of uh, so many things right now. There are uh, certain indicators that tell you that the situation is still far from normal. And then there are certain steps like uh, this uh, big step of uh, uh, restarting uh, mobile uh, telephones, mo mobile connections, at least uh, postpaid uh, uh, is concerned, but it has come as a big relief uh, for the people of the Kashmir Valley. Uh, needless to, to say that's no luxury, no more a luxury. It is a necessity in our day and age and probably it's only Kashmir which can take uh, two and a half months of uh, complete disconnection of a complete blackout as far as communication is concerned. Landlines were restored but uh, we know that in today's age uh, very few people do keep landlines so uh, it was a step that did not help a cross section of the population but yes uh, postpaid uh, mo mo mobile phones working will obviously help uh, almost every family or every household as far as Kashmir Valley is concerned. As you rightly said, getting uh, in touch with their loved ones, uh, emergency services were suffering because for uh, any emergency like even a fire alarm, you had to physically reach the uh, fire office. Uh, and then uh, also medical emergencies were suffering. So at least on that count, uh, people will be benefited. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, still you have prepaid, uh, which will not work. You have internet, which uh, uh, in today's age is backbone of almost everything from education to uh, businesses to entrepreneurs, traders. Uh, all of them have suffered. I mean, uh, people have suffered a lot because of this communication blackout. Uh, questions at the government as to why it uh, took them so long to restore uh, uh, the, the, these phones, uh, mobile phones because indicators, uh, the ground indicators would tell you that from day one itself, uh, probably there was a preconceived script as far as the government is concerned that for these many days, uh, whatever happens on the ground, they are not going to budge from uh, whatever they have planned for Kashmir. And probably there was uh, absolutely zero flexibility as they went on because on the ground there was no violence, uh, people cooperated and still it took them two and a half months to uh, really restore uh, postpaid telephones or should I say postpaid uh, mobile connections. Which which obviously is a big question mark on uh, w w what really went wrong and why it uh, took so long. So now the next step could be uh, internet and obviously that is something that the people are waiting for and uh, prepared, uh, yes, that is also important. But uh, as you rightly said, uh, uh, a unique kind of status quo where every day you have shops uh, shut through the day. There is a kind of a mechanism that has been evolved by the people, traders. Early morning they open shops for a few hours. People buy whatever they can. Then through the day they're shut. In the evening they open again. Yes, private transport is almost completely on the roads because people do not have public transport. It's still missing from the streets. So there are various uh, areas which still uh, need the government attention. They need to do more and uh, probably till those things uh, really don't, ha don't happen, shops don't open, we are still far away from complete normalcy. Education, again, as you rightly said, very thin attendance because okay. this was one factor. Parents had absolutely no communication lines to check on the well-being of uh, their kids. So obviously, if you're a parent, uh, 
uh, you would prefer him to stay safe at home rather than risk him going to the schools with absolutely no way to check up uh, on him. So all these things are happening, but yes, Tanvi, we're still some distance away, some time away before complete normalcy returns and we return to pre uh, Five, uh, 5th of August times. Back to you. Oh yes, absolutely, Farid. I have a couple of more questions for you, so stay on with me. But I want to also play out a few voices uh, that Farid actually got for us earlier in the day. Postpaid, they have started now. If they are prepared, they should be able to get the benefit of it. And because of the net, there are a lot of problems here. Some business has been lost from it. There are a lot of losses. जी मोबाइल सर्विस रेस्टोरेंट से बहुत राहत मिलेगी लेकिन उन्होंने बताया गवर्नमेंट बता रहे कि सिर्फ पोस्ट पेड रेस्टोरेंट जाएंगे बेहतर ये होता कि अगर प्रीपेड भी रेस्टोरेंट हो जाते तो और भी राहत मिलती अगर आज मोबाइल खुल रहे हैं पोस्ट पेड बहुत अच्छी बात है राहत मिल लोगों को कंटैक्ट्स बढ़ेंगे अपने उससे मिलेंगे बिछड़ गए हैं अपने Farid, there was one part of the information that you sent for us, which said that, you know, shops are opening, but they don't, uh, you know, many of them are choosing to then shut down these shops by themselves. Uh, what's happening? Is there some amount of fear or is this simply resistance, you know, a way of showing some kind of resistance? Uh, well, it seems that it is a way of uh, showing some kind of resistance because uh, people feel that uh, the way uh, things happened uh, on the 5th of August was something uh, that uh, could have been done in a better way, in a, in a way where uh, uh, you would have some kind of a consensus or at least people should have known about it. But the way it was done, so probably people still feel very hurt about it and that's why you'll see this spontaneous uh, kind of a shutdown. It's not being backed by anyone. There is no one leading this. It's just that uh, people are doing it on their own, though uh, I would add that as far as uh, traffic is concerned, uh, if we can take it as an indicator of normalcy, people are coming out uh, in their personal private vehicles and uh, we could see a uh, lot of rush, uh, traffic jams in Srinagar today being a Monday. So, uh, but as far as public transport is concerned, it's still off the roads and it is uh, uh, the, the poor people, uh, uh, the, the lower middle class which is suffering because one could really see them on uh, the roads really waiting for something uh, uh, to really take them forward as far as their lives are concerned as far, as far as vehicles or transport is concerned, so they are suffering. Uh, government offices, yes, attendance uh, is uh, good because uh, the, there, is, there are clear directions from the government that employees should uh, be on duty. It, it, it doesn't matter whether people come to offices for their work or not, but people, uh, employees should be there. And same is the case as far as education is concerned because okay. education is something that you cannot get back. You can get back whatever uh, damage happens as far as economy is concerned, but education crucial academic time kids uh, have lost and probably will lose for some more time because uh, we are heading into winters and uh, there's still uh, very little chance that parents will send their kids to school. Still some uncertainty. They feel that still it's not safe, though mobile telephones may help uh, uh, f as far as that cause of the government is concerned. But as I said, still uh, some time before all these, uh, uh, all these spheres of activity as far as a common man's life is concerned, they, they really come back on tracks. All right, Farid, so we will obviously closely be tracking and of course uh, it will be so much more easier now uh, now that we're able to at least get in touch with you and communicate with you more easily. Uh, we will be able to bring out uh, more reports uh, from the valley on what's happening. Thanks, Farid, so much for joining us for now. Well, let's move on to the second big conversation this evening. Now, as the narrative over NRC or the National Register of Citizens bills, a new controversy has now been triggered in the national capital, which is Delhi. Now, of course, you know that the BJP has been pushing for a national register for a while now. And, you know, uh, Home Minister Amit Shah himself has made a series of comments in the parliament and outside saying they believe that the country should have a NRC, a national NRC. Individual state netas have now begun to push for it as well. But here is the interesting twist. Delhi BJP chief Manoj Tiwari is linking the high crime rate in the national capital to the presence of illegal immigrants in the region and then pushing for NRC. That he says NRC is the solution because then you can spot the illegal immigrants and then you can throw them out and deal with the high crime rate. Now, effectively, he say, he's all, even gone on to justify it by saying that I know and my research shows that mobile phones and laptops that have been stolen in Delhi have found their way to a market in Bangladesh. Take a listen. 80% illegal migrants. You have said that 80% of the crime is illegal migrants. What is the reason? How do you think? I think that the 
बहुत एक रिसर्च के बाद आपको बता रहा हूँ कि यहाँ से जो लैपटॉप वगैरह मोबाइल वगैरह छीने जा रहे हैं वो बांग्लादेश में बेचे जा रहे हैं अच्छा और ये सारी चीज़ों का एक रिपोर्ट लेने के बाद ही मैं ये बात बोला हूँ जो अपराध दिल्ली में बढ़े हैं उसमें 80 परसेंट टू 90 परसेंट इलीगल माइग्रेंट्स का विदेशी का इसमें हाथ है उसको जो अरविंद केजरीवाल सेव करते हैं वो दिल्ली में अपराध रोकने में बड़ी बाधा है मैं ये बात बार बार कह रहा हूँ एनसीआर अगर आता है आप एनआरसी के बारे में आप बात करें एनआरसी आपकी सरकार अगर आती है तो एनआरसी आप लेकर हंड्रेड परसेंट एनआरसी लागू करेंगे Well, NCRB has not been releasing crime data, a lot of other data points for several years now. What we can do is refer to statistics that are regularly shared by the Delhi Police. But obviously, that doesn't really tell us who has committed the crime. There is no denying the fact, and some of those examples are on your screen right now. There is no denying the fact that robbery, chain snatching, shootings are a huge problem in the national capital. In fact. Even the Prime Minister's niece recently fell victim to a daylight robbery. But does that mean that illegal immigrants or Bangladeshis are to be blamed for it? And is NRC the starting point to Delhi's crime problem? That's essentially what we are asking this evening. Let's say good evening to our panelists, Yogita Bhayana, our social activist, Sudhanshu Mittal, spokesperson for the BJP, Mr. T.R. Kakkar, former Commissioner of Police of Delhi, and Kamal Mitra Chanoy, a political analyst. So Mr. Mittal, let me start with you. Because obviously we've not gotten any data which uh, you know helps us understand, uh, uh, you know who's committing how many of what kind of crimes. In fact, NCRB doesn't even give us basic data of crime anymore. So, is there any information that you can share with us to shed light on this? I'm very happy that on your panel you have Mr. T R Kakkar here, who's been the former. Commissioner of Police and who is very well versed with the, the crime situation in Delhi. I mean, across the board, when you talk to friends and uh, acquaintances in Delhi Police, this is one uh, concern they have always articulated. They have said that a lot, lot of criminality emits starts from uh, uh, the areas uh, largely occupied by the illegal immigrants. So it is on that basis. I, I agree with you that in case there were statistics. It would have been much better, but for I do not know why they have not been released. But that's a fair. So there are two sides to it. One is the perpetration of the crime. The other side is the NRC itself, the desirability or the requirement or the uh, you know the effectiveness of this as as something to control illegal Im immigrants. Okay. I think it's most desirable. This country certainly. This country certainly must protect. Fair enough, fair enough. So, Mr. Sudhanshu Mittal, if I may, we've had a series of debates on the merits of the NRC. At this point, I don't want to get into that again because there is a new, um, new news point, a news, new angle, and a new reason that you are giving us right now. So, let's just first focus on that. Now, since you are saying that this is through your conversations with you know those in the Delhi Police uh, and stories that are then shared. Can you tell me what kind of crimes are Bangladeshi primarily accused of or involved in? And where are the Bangladeshis? Petty thefts, uh, snatching, a lot. Hello? Yes, what kind of crimes? Sorry, I couldn't lot, hear you. A lot snatching? Of, uh, pet, a, a, lot of, a lot of petty crimes which take place, including okay. chain snatching, Pickpocketing and all these crimes they have been involved with. Okay, and and bootlegging a large large amount of uh, cases of bootlegging. Uh huh. A and large amount of cases relating to bootlegging. Uh, uh, these these have been largely reported uh, from uh, Bangladeshis here. Okay, and uh, and again I will ask you this question: What is the basis of this uh, uh, stand or a comment that you've made? Because as far as I'm given to understand. There is very little, uh, you know, uh, a very small percentage of these crimes actually get solved in our uh, national capital. They're barely ever manage, uh, managing to f uh, catch these people and convict them. Yeah, solving of crime and uh, the people doing crimes are two different things. Conviction is, is, Sorry, a, how? is a subtly an issue which is uh, not only relevant. So we know they are Bangladeshis, but we are not able to catch these Bangladeshis. The conviction rate. 
We know they are Bangladeshis, but we are not able to catch so them. You are, as I explained to you, if please, Mr. Mr. Kakkar is here, and I think he'll be able to enlighten us more on this. No, no, fair enough. And I will take and, 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 and with Singh, great respect, I will. Which is done. With great respect, I, I, I you know, I will the welcome mapping, the, the expert views of Mr. Kakkar. I am done, simply asking you these is, questions the because you are a representative the of, of the ruling the party at the centre. You are a representative of the BJP that is now obviously going to be fighting elections in Delhi very soon. One of your, your agendas has become getting in the NRC because you claim that Bangladeshis are responsible for the rising crime in national capital. So I'm simply asking you, what is it that we don't know, that the police won't tell us, that you know and how do you know that but fair enough let let me go across to mr kakkar because mr kakkar uh, uh, correct me if i am wrong but uh, there is very uh, little evidence on paper that i have so i would like to hear from you is there merit to this charge i will take your question in two parts one is the illegal immigrants and their effect on the law and order situations in Delhi. The other is, are really Bangladeshis and others involved in the rise in crime in Delhi? Now, when we, when Mr. Manoj Tiwari said illegal immigrants, I think most of the people felt that he's, he's talking of people coming from other states and all the very few people. Not many people know what is illegal. Illegal is, uh, you, you know, of course, and there are people who are educated know, that this means people who do not belong to this country when they come into this country, whether they live in Delhi, Bombay, Pune, Mumbai, uh, 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 Amritsar, and uh, even in Jammu. Now, we have a large number of Bangladeshis in, in the city. We know about it, and we also know where exactly are they, most of them located. That is one issue. Uh, therefore, NRC, if uh, all leaders, uh, the uh, ruling party leaders are advocating that there has to be NRC countrywide, I think there's nothing bad in it. We, we may or may not send them back to their country, but we must know how many foreigners live here and, and uh, on their living. That, that is one side. Now, the other is, do the immigrants, I have not say illegal immigrants, do the immigrants contribute to the rise in crime in, in the cities? Yes, they do. Let me tell you what happens. Whether they are Bangladeshis or somebody else, they come into this city. Earlier, our estimate was that five to six lakh people annually come and settle down in Delhi. Now it is around three to four lakhs, that is the estimate. And when they come here, they, they have no place to live, they have no jobs. They have no support system either. So what happens is when they, they try and find uh, uh, some sort of a shelter, they try and find some sort of a job, all of them cannot get into, get, get the job or the shelter. So what they do is they indulge in, in crimes. These could be petty crimes because they have to live. This is what I rest, uh, earlier when the studies were conducted. Most, now, for example, we have Delhi police should be scared that in uh, now the winter is setting in, and therefore this so-called uh, earlier the Bangladeshis were invo involved in large number of cases of kacha banyan gang. They would enter in, when people are sleeping and they sound sleep, they'll enter and uh, smash their heads and then take away things. These things do happen in the winter. One has to be careful about it. What I'm trying to say, the people who do not have shelter, who mm. do not have jobs, who do not have support system, obviously will do something which is Correct. injurious to the peace. But Mr. Kakkar, I take your point. Citizens. Yes. This is what is happening. Correct. Okay? I take your point. But, but you said, you know, so there, there are illegal so, immigrants so, and there are immigrants. So let's, and the let's problem not, can be not, even from immigrants. Let's not dissect. No, no, but here is my question let's, then. Let's not. Here is my question. Let's if these are legal immigrants, this, Mr. Kakkar, this, the yes, state yes, has all the power in the world be, you know, to pick these people again, up, to track them no, down no, and throw them out you. of our country. Give me, give me a minute. Yes. Give me a minute. Please do. Please I, will, I will clear, I will clear I, your this doubt also. Uh, give me a minute. Now, what happens is immigrants and illegal immigrants. You know, the immigrants, very soon they find somebody who belongs to their village, who belongs to their mala from some quarter, and 
put up with him or start sharing something that he earns. While the illegal immigrants are scared, all the time scared, mm. and therefore, first, they don't get uh, a roof on their head. They, they don't get a roof on their head. They don't get jobs because some, most of the people are scared of employing the Ill, illegal immigrants because they have to report to the police and they have to, uh, there are a lot of forms to be filled up, etc., etc. So while they don't have anything, they definitely will indulge in crime and they do indulge in crime. Okay, all right. Let me go across uh, to Mr. Kamal Mitra Chinoy. Mr. Chinoy, there are multiple aspects to this, but fact of the matter is, right now, we don't know. There is nothing to suggest that these illegal immigrants, effectively, if you're talking NRC, you know, it's the Bangladeshis that the BJP is referring to, are the cause for rise in crime in our city. Is there something that you would like to add to this? Is there any data that you know about? Well, look, Tanvi, I am a Bengali. I understand Bengali. Most of the time when I move in various areas, including Hearts, uh, Chandni Chowk, other big uh, uh, marketing places, I don't hear uh, very much Bengali. In fact, there's much more Punjabi, Haryanvi, etc., etc. So this, yes, there uh, can be illegal immigration, but it need not be Bangladeshi. And after all, the whole of uh, that part of uh, Bengal was for a long time part of uh, Indian Bengal. And that is why there is coming and going. But the important point is that the NRC cannot be used, as Mr. Manoj Tiwari said, to be used like that in Delhi. Because you have to have a larger scale in which you can uh, deal with it. And as Mr. Kakkar has pointed out, and as a police officer he would know, there are different types of criminal or other activities by immigrants. They need not be illegal. Some will be. And these people are not able to make the kind of shelter and jobs and so forth that they like. And that is why you have th that particular problem. Hmm. But the way of solving a problem is creating better space and better facilities and not uh, damning people as belonging to a particular community and as a threat to the Indian nation. I don't think that is uh, there. And if you see Ranjan Gogoi and other people's discussion on the NRC, he after all is uh, himself an Assamese, there is no real discussion of any severe amount of immigration. So I think this is overstated. And of course, though uh, I agree with Sudhanshu, yes, there should be uh, more surveys. There can be more discussion. There can be ways to resort to uh, things where there is poor facilities from water to huts to roads. That should be fixed so that people do not suffer and uh, events that are not necessary but, take place. But, but, but I that... don't think we should overstate this problem. Okay, Mr. Zadanshu Mittal, respond to that before I go to Yogita Bhayana. I think Mr. Chinoy largely has not disputed the fact that there is a problem which can be attributed to them. I mean, because in the absence of any empirical data, there can always be a debate on the matter. So two things, as far as NRC is concerned, certainly there is a desirability of the NRC which should identify and isolate people who are illegal uh, immigrants to the country. Hmm. Especially in Delhi, they, they should be identified. And secondly, as I said, <coughs> Mr. Kakkar has also said uh, the Kacha Banyan gang largely, you know, uh, representing the Bangladeshis which have been a security threat. And, yes, Bangladeshis. Uh, been yes. responsible for crime. Bangladeshis. I mean, I know at the... At the can, can, can I finish? Yeah, that's what I said, Naji. The Isile Kerao, because at a, at a police uh, station level, I have seen the, op, uh, the way it operates. Mm. And in terms of the mapping of uh, the area, there is specific mapping of the illegal immigrants which are settled in that particular area. And a special vigil is kept on them because there is, uh, historically, it has been observed by the police that there a large number of criminality has emitted from these areas. So that's a reality. And it is basis of this reality that this kind of a statement has been made or a demand of this kind has been made. Because certainly, 
Delhi needs to check its uh, crime records. B, Delhi needs to check illegal immigrants which are now settling in India and more, more, uh, they're settling in Delhi. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comment or it's an observation and it's a demand based on reasonability and experience. Okay, Yogita Bhana, what, what is your view? Is there a problem? You know, there is a large population that cannot be denied. They live in these ghettos. Uh, re, uh, there have been at least two instances that I recount, including one very recently where a massive face-off happened between, you know, uh, residents of, uh, of one society and the Bangladeshis who are working in that area. So there is a problem. Is NRC the solution? See, Tanvi, uh, this is a very smart move by Manoj Tiwari. It's a very easy way out from all the problems, all the crimes which are happening in Delhi. Every minute there is, there are, there are, there is a crime happening uh, related to these kind of crimes. I'm not talking about uh, crimes related to women and children. I'm only talking about these kind of petty crimes. As you call them petty, it is not as what everybody is calling them, it really digs into the person's uh, well-being. Everything goes for a toss because I, deal, I have gone through similar experiences. So what I'm just trying to tell you is that it's very easy to say that it is done by illegal Im Im immigrants. If you call them illegal, it's fine. If they're immigrants, it's fine. But is this, this is very easy to blame it on them. 90% he said the crimes are done by them. So, I mean, what are they doing otherwise about the crimes? They don't know the real picture. The real picture is that most of the crimes are done by juveniles and they are being, uh, you know, utilized as time bombs and placed here and there. They are not doing anything about the dropouts. They are not doing anything about the hardcore education for these dropouts, channelizing the energy of the youth of this city. And they are doing the crimes. Youth, I don't know where they got their uh, study from. This study is totally a myth. It's just the eyewash. It's it's totally fake. I, I bet you that because I work on grassroots level, I can tell you most of the crimes are done by any anybody here, but they are mostly juveniles are being used for such crimes. So they need to really get into the real picture and see who is actually doing the crime. And it's easy to tell that, you know, the, send them back to uh, Bangladesh, NRC. This was the beautiful way of getting NRC introduced as a political agenda. There's nothing to do with crime. Must be, a few, few percentage must be there, but I'm not denying that. But they need to see, this cannot be, uh, you know, if you uh, send them back, the Delhi will be crime-free. Is that you're trying to say? That will be more than happy. Bring it out, bring out the NRC. We'll okay, if 90% of if the crimes, uh, rising crimes are uh, being done by Bangladeshis, and you get NRC and you throw them out, will Delhi be crime-free, Mr. Sudhan Shumitil? A, throwing them out or not throwing them out is not the issue right now. The okay. mapping itself is very critical and isolation of such elements is also very, very critical. Certainly, it will be an effective tool to check crimes. Map, as far you, as we Yogita don't know where these illegal uh, Bangladeshis are living in, in the that, national capital right now. Can I finish? Even as an outsider, can I, can you, know, I you, you know, I'm given to understand can that almost everybody knows where they live, where they work, what kind of work they do. Everybody knows that. Isn't it like an open secret? I'm sure the police knows for sure. Tanviji, that's what I'm saying. Nah? Instead, of, instead of it being uh, 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 something to be guessed about, okay. the moment you are, you are identifying them and mapping them, it's a scientific way of establishing the truth about it. Like we are debating, these are perceptions what we are debating. So, okay, so let me make this very evidence. clear, because you there are saying it's a perception, Sudhanshu Mittal. Manoj Tiwari obviously has a very different thing to say about it. According to Manoj Tiwari, Can he's done a research. He says he's done a research. He very well knows that the, the uh, well, mobile phones and the I'm laptops sure that are stolen in the national capital are sold in Bangladeshi markets. So he has some facts that he's very sure of. 90% according to him. That 90% of the crime that are happening in Delhi is happening by Bangladeshis. Mr. Kakkar, I don't that know must be. if Manoj Tiwari has shared this information with Delhi police, but is that is that something I... that you know police is also aware of? Well, it is. Well, uh, it, uh, I would have Tiwari, really appreciated if uh, somebody would have asked Mr. Manoj. Well, one minute, please. One minute, Mr. Kakkar. I can. Yes, I can only say. Yeah. Yes, sir. I can only. I can only say that 99 percent or 90 percent is too large a figure hmm. to be attributing it to the Bangladeshis, but they do commit crime, and they not only commit crime of this nature, that is theft, snatching, robberies. 
they also indulge in bootlegging, they also indulge in uh, b prostitution, etc. Because, as I told you earlier, they will do everything that is possible to make a living to begin with because they have nothing. They have no relatives, they have uh, probably uh, no support system, therefore they will do that. But as and, as and when they start, most of them, what are they doing? They are mostly employed as, as menial servants in Correct. the houses, in the shops, in other places. So gradually, the, gradually things become okay. Now, uh, somebody mentioned that, uh, uh, why this NRC? Why, why are we shying away from the NRC? Which other country permits so many of illegal people to be staying on their land? Why are we shying away? Its question is, now at the end of the day, after the NRC uh, is implemented, it is for the government to decide whether these people to be deported or they have to be kept under watch. Hmm. Uh, until such time, we, we declare them as citizens and give them the identifiable documents. Okay. Now, Which other country? I Let me take uh, that point. We, Indian, and, and, and we Indians are... Uh, we want we want to come everybody to come in we okay. want everybody to come in and that is no, not it's a, not, a it's good not thing. about everybody coming in mr kakar it's about those who've now lived here for 30 40 years to turn around and say well uh, you have spent half your life here your children were born raised here part of this society no, no, but please that, get they out they still now remain, they still remain illegal they, uh, they not not know, they if hair, you if you admit okay let me take years, your point they keep getting their kids and kids they keep getting their Well, that people. is the failure of the current government and the previous series of governments who've allowed this to Manly, fester. I want to make a point if if the governments successively have failed in no, stopping no, illegal no, immigration no, 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 and if the governments no, no. successively have failed in throwing no. out those who came in legally but never went back, then that is an administrative failure. That is a government failure. But Kamal Mitra Chinoy, if you agree that there is a problem, then a, do you agree I say, that I would identifying say it them... It was a political failure, yes. not the administrative failure. Okay, a political failure. I take your point. I completely take your point. Kamal Mata Chanoy, then what is the solution if this is, this is a problem? Listen, I think, you know, we should go back to some history. In 1971, India had a problem, fought Pakistan, and Bangladesh was liberated. After that, th there have been more and more uh, arguments saying that the Bangladeshis are a threat to the b better parts of Indian society, um, Indian trends, etc. So what is being done is that a particular community is being identified as criminal. And Manoj Tiwari went to the extent of saying that things that are stolen are 80 to 90 percent by Bangladeshis. Now where have these statistics to come from? Mm. I can understand uh, Mr. Kakkar since he's a police officer that he knows what is going where and he said very clearly that these people are forced to live in some ways which are not good but that is the way the system is functioning mm. but to say that something is so bad that it has to be said to be 80 or 90 percent and then to bring in nrc in delhi is ridiculous where is the need for an nrc in delhi which is fairly well handled uh, fairly well settled it is just an attempt to make a point because after all NRC was discussed okay. and largely led by uh, the Chief Justice of India who yes. never said that NRC had these kind of problems okay. and there were these outrageous immigration problems. Okay, so I, I, I'm quickly going to get a response from Sudhanshu Mittal before I go to Yogita. Mr. Mittal, uh, Sam, there was a huge debate about changing demographics and how it was beginning to impact the people of that state. Where is the need for NRC in Delhi is what Kamal Mitra Chana is asking. Mr. Chinoy does not uh, seem to be recollecting history. There was a uh, accord between all Assam um, Student program, Union and uh, the central government in 1985. On, on 15th August 1985, in yes, which but not in Delhi. the demand for NRC was accepted by the central government because before that, can I finish? I, I do not inter intervene. So, because his, before that, there was a five year long agitation by the people of Assam whose demography got changed because of the infiltration by Bangladeshi immigrants. In Delhi, a large settlement of Bangladeshi immigrants is known and they are spread all across the city. 
Now, if somebody wants to identify them and isolate them, to say where is the need to identify and isolate them, and this is a sinister no, design. It's not or just, it no, it's not just. No, no, no. Please don't digital. downplay it by simply I saying you yes, want to identify and digital. isolate them. Let's just make it very clear. You're literally blaming them for this the crime in the national capital. Allow me to speak. Capital. I think. I think. No, I but have no, no you're saying the same thing me. for the third time. Tell so me, I have every right right now to interfere. Interjecting. You are Allow me, don't, do not the interject. Same thing for the no, no, you time. have permitted everybody Please to speak. Please explain to me, moment, I how is it the same than blaming one community for the crime? You are putting the fear in the minds of people that these Bangladeshis are responsible for your crime rate. This is ridiculous. What the hell is this? Getting into my country illegally is a crime. Is a crime. So one minute, please. One minute. Is a crime. So I know it is a don't, crime. Don't, so so you, think you, think you don't need to yell unnecessarily. I have been extremely I patient. My argument you are repeating the same thing for the third time. I have every right to intervene. Now, don't do theatrics what unnecessarily. Is this is not I one of those channels <coughs> where you sit and do theatrics the in a debate. And Let's have a constructive conversation. My point to you is you are simply putting this in the minds of people that these this community is responsible for rising crime in your city you have admitted it's only it's only only information or view based on something that people have said there are no official statistics there is no research done then why are you putting the fear of a community in the minds of other people do you realize what you're doing? It's not simply saying, let's identify and isolate. You are telling the people of this country, beware. Ye chor hai, ye daku hai. Inki wajay se chori chakari, murder ho raha hai, tumhare shahar mein, nikalo inko bahar. Bina kisi evidence ke, bina kisi research ke, aap ye comment kaise maar sakte hai? What is, what is the evidence required? What do you mean? What is I the mean, evidence you, required? You know, How many Bangladeshis have you caught? Did How many illegal Bangladeshis you have you caught in any of these crimes? Inciting violence. You can stand you and make any comment. Individual. When you say what that kind of irresponsible behavior is this? You are the one. Are you a Maro gang? What kind of a person are you? You are an irresponsible anchor. You are inciting violence. You should be ashamed of yourself. When did uh, Mr. Manoj Tiwari say Maro Inko? Don't lie on television. Are you? You should be ashamed of yourself. Here is what, what is, I said. Is Let me repeat it for you since you, you don't have the habit of listening. You are more seen. interested in how yelling. Can you, how can now, you use this now, now keep are, quiet and listen to me. Here is what you I am said. trying to explain to you. You don't, you don't have any information. No, no. Can we please get Mr. Sudhanshu Mittal back? He needs to listen to what I am saying right now. Mr. Sudhanshu Mittal, you don't know. You have no statistics. You have no information. And your party is sitting and making large comments and the grand comments about Bangladeshis and papers, illegal immigrants based on what information? So I where, where is the statistic? As and when where is the statistic? I them as Who criminal? said Nobody can stop me. Where is the statistic? How many Bangladeshis have been caught? When a decision is taken. <coughs> Nobody so said don't, that. Don't, tell me, don't start you accommodating tell everybody. You people, you people do not... Do not realize... You are... You people do not realize... Mr. Kakar, please. Okay, How this country has humanity. got affected you because of these now people? provoking violence and you should apologize here. <laughs> Mr. Sudhanshu, you, you have a Mr. problem with hearing. You don't listen to people because maybe that's how that's how you your party is listening to it. Please point. listen to Why what I have said. Go back and listen to what I have said. said. Nobody here is sitting and supporting Who illegal immigrants. And I want to make this very clear Repeat. to Mr. Kakkar also. Go, go, Nobody here is sitting and supporting illegal immigrants. The point is very clear. Before anybody makes this a political agenda, a poll agenda, you are putting that mind, that thought in people's no, minds. No, no, no. You are Why putting are that you, thought in I people's mind. Sudhanshu so Mittal, you are putting that thought in people's mind by identifying one community and blaming it for the failures of your Delhi police. By blaming, by blaming Bangladeshis for the failures of your Delhi police. Completely out of time, because I'm going to thank all of our panelists for joining us on this conversation. Here is the point. You have heard the BJP spokesperson say it three times on this debate that there is no actual official statistic or data available to suggest that the rising crime in the national capital is because of Bangladeshis or the illegal immigrants. Yes, they exist. Yes, some of them have been linked to crimes. Yes, there is a problem because they are not registered anywhere. They barely get jobs. They live in ghettos. So obviously there is a problem in the way they live and exclusion. Now we are not sitting here and backing illegal immigrants. We are simply questioning a party's stand 
that seeks to put a thought in your mind, that seeks to put a fear in your mind, that one community is responsible for all the crime happening in your vicinity. Think about the kind of messaging and the narrative that is being settled there. By all means, go ahead. Do the research. Get us the statistics. How many Bangladeshis responsible for robbery, responsible for chain snatching? How many of them are responsible for daylight murders and the shootouts in the national capital? And then, let's please have this conversation. Thank you for joining us on debate number two. Let's move on to the big conversation number three. And this is India's most sensational serial murder case. Sinai Jolly case is getting murkier now. Another big political link has emerged between prime accused Jolly Amma and the Netas in Kerala. Crime branch raided the residence and shops of senior Muslim League leader BK Imbitchi Moi after the probe team found that the leader had allegedly helped Jolly Joseph prepare a fake title deed. Now, we are given to understand this from the police that this man helped her with these fake documents so that she could inherit, it, inherit the properties of her husband. Probe had earlier also found that another neta had helped her forge documents. Cops searched his house after Jolly stated that her Aadhaar and Russian cards were with the politician. Remember earlier it was a CPI, local committee secretary, who was found to have allegedly forged documents in favour of Jolly Amma. Deadly Jolly Amma has allegedly confused to killing six people from her own family for property, love and greed. Police claims they are also investigating her for plotting two more murders. And the victim's family also claims that she killed two other people. So that's the extent of the number of murders she has been booked for, which is six. Number of murders that she is facing investigation for, three more. And number of murders she is accused of plotting, two more. That's the extent of this cyanide serial murder case. Never heard before, right out of a crime thriller. What's going on? Let's get you the latest. John Mary, editor at large for Deccan Chronicle, joins us this evening. Swaranjit Singh, former DGP of Andhra Pradesh itself. Uh, John, good evening. Thank you for joining us. You know, this is, this is getting murkier by the day. You know, some may not even want to believe it. The, the, the kind of stories that are emerging. What, what stumps me is, how was it under wraps for so long? See, the classical question is, someone wants to murder someone, someone wants to assassinate someone, is it possible? You've seen that, you know, prim, prime ministers and presidents have been assassinated, despite all foolproof security system. I think uh, in this particular case, <laughs> Hindsight wisdom would tell us that, you know, the police should have done this, the law enforcing agency should have done this, the revenue authority should have done this. But when something, a crime breaks out like this, nobody suspects it is a crime. Six deaths have taken place, and now we say, characterize them as murders. But from, the, from 2002 to, 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 to as far as now, say 14 years later, you've got about six six deaths took place, and now you've classified them as six murders. And um, what is the system that we have? We have about so much of traffic accidents. Some of them could be murders. We don't know. How do we inquire into that? Unless you get a suspicion, a plausible enough case of suspicion. In this particular case also, first, it was a case of the mother-in-law, Jolie Emma's mother-in-law. She died after taking mutton soup in Kori Code. And then what happened? Time later, the husband, that is the father-in-law of Joliema dies. Years later, Joliema's husband dies. When Joliema's husband dies, there is an autopsy conducted. Not at the insistence of the wife. The wife is all bereaved and all that, you know, nobody would suspect her to do anything. Then someone in the family, that is the Jolema's husband's paternal uncle. He suspects that there is something hanky-panky in this, and he, he insists on a post-mortem, what he call an autopsy, and where a cyanide trace is being detected. And you know what the bereaved family told the police? 
they told the police that don't investigate this cyanide he he ingested cyanide correct he committed suicide any further probe into this would only would only expose us so we don't want we our children need to be married off they need they have a future so don't do this leave it as leave it, leave it as it is right. this is that i can tell you Oh, that's very interesting, and you know, um, and it's that part actually is not surprising. Often in our country, uh, we don't want further investigations to be done because you know we have, we we, we uh, people come under pressure of what the people will say, what how it will impact the future generations. But Mr. Swaranjit Sen, is it that easy, you know, to get cyanide, or will somebody have to be well connected, maybe have some <coughs> political links, uh, some 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 help uh, from the uh, law and order establishment? How does one go about? Out giving cyanide to at least six people, if not more. Well, what you're saying is really amazing. And of course, the entire situation is shocking. Is cyanide that easily available? We'll have to really look into how the Department of Drugs and Pharmaceuticals uh, operates, what is the licensing system, and how they can, under what circumstances they can provide these things. But what amazes me is that six years, six deaths, three more investigations underway, and probably two more which were being planned in 14 years, and nobody has suspected this girl. Now, I'm, I'm glad that you started off by saying that she does have some political patronage because I would look to find out who is the mentor for this girl. Who is the mentor and the connections that she has, are there any more murders connected with those people for whom she may have given some favors? in the way of peddling this cyanide or, you know, ingest, uh, in, uh, uh, providing the cyanide. So it's, it's uh, not a small case. It is a case which has to be very, very deeply investigated. And now what the other gentleman was saying about the autopsy saying the use of cyanide, the point is, unless the police was really sure that it was self-ingested, for which there should be some kind of, you know, symptom uh, uh, the evidence on the body. How did the police quietly accept this? Was right. there pressure on the police? There are so many questions which are left unanswered, which must be investigated into even now by the highest kind of uh, authority and not just le left to the middle level. Six murders, you don't suspect this person who has been connected with all of them. I mean, uh, how does... Uh, you know, and, I, and, I, I would and the way more and more are tumbling out. the had we, better wisdom. Day one, we were shocked, extremely shocked, Mr. Sen, when the story came exactly. out. And then they no. said there were six, she's been booked for yes. six murders over yes. 14 years. And on day two, the police came out and said, well, two more murders that she allegedly plotted, we are investigating, she was perhaps going to kill two more people. Now, and then on day four, we were told that, well, the family of one of the victims has said that there were two other deaths in the family. One, at that point, they thought was an accident. The second one, they thought was a suicide. They, they now suspected that she had killed them. A serial killer, a woman, a housewife, allegedly went about wiping off two full families over a period of 14 years. Allegedly, as per the police case right now, and nobody realized for 14 long years that obviously there was some help involved. There was obviously something wrong with this entire law and order scrutiny system. How was cyanide so easily available? Who was helping her with all of this cyanide? Did her political connections and those that she was linked to politically know about this? Were they also giving her some kind of protection? Those are the answers that we are now looking for. It's a sensational case. And let's not forget, is this an easy way out for the local police to start blaming her for murders or for deaths? 
which may not even have been linked to her to begin with. Think about it. We'll continue to keep a track and get you the latest on this big story. For now, it's a wrap on Urban Debate at 8 p.m.